Hang on, got to finish tweeting here. One sec. All right, there we go. Okay, excellent. Hi, everybody. Boy, what a good crowd this is tonight. A large crowd in downtown Toronto when the subject is the demise of the Liberal Party. Who would have imagined? Okay, what a shock. Uh, here's how we're going to approach tonight. We have uh, two people tonight who know politics probably better than any two people around today. Uh, on the far end, John Duffy, who I'm not sure was a Liberal in the womb, but shortly thereafter, I think the answer was yes. Uh, John has worked on innumerable campaigns for, for the Liberal Party federally and provincially, and uh, may have a wee issue with the prognosis of our other guest book. Uh, but um, John is a, a, a principal at a firm called Strategy Corp, uh, has been in the back rooms of the Liberal Party many, many times, and I look forward to seeing his name on a ballot someday as well. John, that's the one thing you haven't done. John Duffy. And in the middle, one of the truly legendary journalists and authors uh, that this country has ever seen. Uh, this is book number 647 for him. <laughs> and the title is not at all provocative. When the Gods <laughs> Changed the Death of Liberal Canada, Peter C. Newman. Well, as you all know, in the uh, federal election earlier this year, the Liberals found themselves in quite uncharted territory. Third place, first time ever, 34 seats, the least they'd ever won. What we want to do through some discussion here this evening is to find out how much of that was Michael Ignatieff's fault, he is the leader of the party, and how much of that was maybe 10 or 20 years in the making. And I want to start, Mr. Newman, with you first. Here we go. How problematic do you think it was for the Liberals that Michael Ignatieff returned after 34 years abroad, became a member of parliament in 2006, and barely a week after taking his seat, decided he's running for leader. At that point, he knew only three liberals by their first names. <laughs> but the, the liberals who had recruited him, and uh, one of them is in this room. Um, so, he was, um, not only the country was strange, but the party was strange, the function was strange, and uh, he didn't realize, and he should have, but he didn't realize that he, after all, had spent his whole life as an intellectual chasing truth. What is the truth of this particular equation that he's doing? And, uh, of course, politicians chase power, and power and truth just don't just don't cross. <laughs> uh, so that it, it was kind of a, uh, a loss from the beginning. You know, he would have had to remake his whole life, and he couldn't do that, and he wouldn't do that. Um, on the other hand, there was a, there was a kind of a, uh, I, I won't call it a conspiracy, but you know, I was on the bus when he, when he toured the country. And he got great receptions. Everywhere he went, he would speak every night, and he'd get great applause, and people would say, my goodness, what a great leader he's going to be. And uh, it was about halfway through that I realized these were all liberals, you know? It, it, Preaching to the converted. Yeah, so he, yes, exactly. And he, he didn't know that. See, if he had come up through the party, he would know all those people. Let me get John to follow up on that. Was it? I mean, cl clearly, it's it was a problem that he had been away for so long and missed so many of the things that that people like you, for example, participated in in all those years. But did you think when he won the leadership that was overcomable? Um, I'm I'm not sure that it was. Uh, I I had this impression. Um, there are a lot of jokes that were made about, about Michael's ethnicity, and, and I should say I wasn't particularly a supporter of his. I, 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 uh, I sat out the 2006 campaign, uh, leadership campaign, and I worked for, for Bob Ray and what passed for the leadership campaign of 2008, which kind of just kind of got short-circuited. Um, but I had the impression uh, when he assumed control of the Liberal Party, you remember the scene in Dr. Zhivago, when Yuri Zhivago comes in with Jerry, you know, Omar Sharif comes in with Geraldine Chaplin, and they come into the ruins of this formerly lovely, you know, cottage, and it's got ice dripping all down it, and he's looking and going, 
what a beautiful place. Wow, these icicles are gorgeous. And she's just looking, oh yeah, honey, this place is great. Um, they, <laughs> it'll be terrific. You'll learn farming, no problem. Um, I, there was something of someone trying to learn farming uh, who'd been a poet and a physician all of his life to, to Michael's uh, reintroduction to Canadian politics because he had been involved when he was a young person. Um, but there was also something of the ruined estate uh, to the Liberal Party. Uh, and while Peter and I really don't, don't, uh, don't agree about the prognosis, I think, as will probably come out, um, the, uh, I think the sense that uh, the party had become one of these dilapidated Chekhovian Pasternak estates, a really run-down operation uh, that really uh, uh, wasn't ready uh, and, 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 and needed a lot more than just a good new farmer. Gonna, uh, is gonna, really, really what, what happened. So there was a lot on both sides. Right. We're, we're going to probably take the first part of the discussion and focus on Mr. Gnadiev himself. Then the second part of our discussion, we'll talk about how ready the party was to yeah. host him, as it were. <laughs> um, you pointed out one of the three amigos who went down to Boston to mm -hmm. try to convince him to come back up here is here tonight. I won't embarrass him by, by pointing him out. But uh, Al Fapps, Dan Brock, Ian Davey were the three guys who went down there. Uh, he apparently said, I'm... Uh, you know, eventually, he said, I'm finished as a spectator. I want to now be an activist. I want to, I want to be more than observer. I want, I'm ready for the responsibility. Was he ready for the responsibility? I don't think, uh, I think he was ready for the responsibility as far as he could understand it. But he was not ready to lead the, this liberal party because it wasn't ready for the election. It wasn't ready for anything. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, you have to go back almost to Trudeau. For, for, you know, the party was led originally by amateurs, um, by uh, volunteers, uh, and I call it the Tom Axworthy party. You know, it was a kind of a shorthand, mm -hmm. because he, he was the leader of that um, progressive wing of the party that made us what we are. I mean, the Canada we have is the Liberal Party uh, made it because, you know, we, they've been in power every decade except one in the last century. And eventually it became a job. The people who were running the party, uh, they got rid of all the volunteers and all the amateurs and uh, it became uh, an occupation. Okay, but let me jump in for a second there because I do want to hold off on the party itself. Mr. Ignatieff himself, he'd followed politics, he'd watched politics, he was a delegate at that 68 convention that picked Trudeau. So it's not like he, you know, he didn't just fall off a turnip truck and come back. He was steeped in Canadian, his father was a, a big presence in Canadian politics. But, but sometimes journalists think that because they've watched it for a long time, they can do it. Did you find that when push came to shove, he really couldn't do it. That's right. And don't forget the, the party was still in good shape in 68. That, that was the highlight of the party. Um, and uh, go back to Kingston, the Kingston Conference, that produced uh, you know, the Pearson uh, min minority, but a huge amount of uh, good legislation. And then Trudeau took over. And um, he got everybody excited about the Liberal Party um, until um, the, just the last few months when he was, um, remember he got defeated and then he came back and won again. And um, there, was, there was a lot of dissatisfaction after that. He'd been there 16 years. Yeah. That's a long time to be prime minister. And um, they, they wanted change. Well, they got, um, they got Kretschan, they got um, uh, Martin, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Done taken. Yeah. You know, and, and Martin, um, I, char I characterize Martin as um, that no good intention w went unpunished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all kinds of good intentions, all kinds of priorities, um, but nothing much happened. And uh, in fact, you can see the, the election, you know, the first one was 135 seats, then, it, then he's down to 107, and then he's out. And that was after a lifetime of preparation. Mm. What about it? Michael Ignati, was he, was he, he thought he was ready he th for the responsibility. Was he really? I, evidently not. Um, as, as Peter's book details, you know, in a way that 
that is really pretty touching um, to read about. I think I, I, I got the sense reading it of that, that Ignatiev had a plan to go up a certain learning curve, uh, which was steep enough, which is go into public life, returning to your homeland after 30 years, becoming an important public intellectual figure in a, in a tough market like London. Uh, he had planned that curve, but I think the curve actually, the, the rock face was even more vertical um, because of the, the change in the way that politics has been practiced here. We're in the midst of a, of a, of a revolution in public life that's built around new technology um, and one of the most advanced practitioner organizations in the world of new political technology is the Conservative Party of Canada. They are redefining the rock face. And so there's, you know, you have this impression of there's, you know, Michael setting out and he's got his later hose on and he's going to go up the hill and the hill keeps getting steeper and pretty soon you're just scrambling. Uh, and it, and it, 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 the game was changing on him even as he was trying to change to meet the game. And it just became asymptotical and impossible for him to ascend it. Here's a quote from the book. It takes a very long time to learn the discipline of getting up in the morning and saying to yourself, what do I intend to say? What is the message? What issue should I take a position on? What issue should I stay away from? I can't begin to tell you, Peter Newman, I can't begin to tell you how difficult it was for me to learn. It's been very humbling. There have been moments when I've asked myself, why exactly did I think I would be good at this? He had intellectual smarts, no question about it. Did he have political smarts? Well, the, the image I have of him is quite different. The image I have of him is waking up in the morning, having a stick, and going out among the beehives and poking the stick and the bees coming out and, and fighting them. You know, that's, that's the kind of life he led, and I don't know how he lasted as long as he did. It shouldn't have been that way, though, right? I mean, this, for, for as brilliant as he was, he clearly didn't seem to know what being a politician was about, at least not at the beginning. It took him a while to learn. Yeah, I, 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 I had a long talk with uh, Adam Gopnik from The New Yorker when Gopnik was writing his piece about Ignatiev, and, and uh, I destroyed a, 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 a uh, spousal visit to Stratford one weekend by spending <laughs> the entire time on the cell phone going, it's The New Yorker, honey, okay, like, yeah, you know, I don't usually get to do this, so, so my apologies, darling, my wife is here with my family. Oh, darling's here. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, and I remember we were talking about some of these these questions, and and you know the way that the way that Michael was working out the change from being an observer to being a participant. And Gopnik and I had gotten into a position where we pretty much you could sort of feel I'm going, oh okay, so kind of it's going to kind of work, right? And I was like, well, you know, I guess so. I'm mean, a good party guy spinning an international thing. I'm going to say, of course it's going to work. It's going to be great. We're going to win big. And then I read, you know, uh, the actual article, and it had a line in it of Michael's that that Gopnik was quoting favorably, and it was something to the effect of uh, a kind, you know, there's a need for a new kind of less recondite cosmopolitanism. And I was like, ah, ah, you know, is this a conservative attack ad of what comes out of this guy's mouth? And it's it's, it's really, really, really difficult transition he was making. Peter, his main problem was very simple. He couldn't connect with people. And I don't mean just what, what are called ordinary people. I mean anybody. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, that's not true. But, uh, let, let me play a little devil's advocate here. Because uh, uh, Susanna, he connected. But by the end of the campaign, um, I, I'm going to challenge that. By the end of the campaign, he, he looked like he was doing just fine on that front. It took him a while to get his feet, but he, but he eventually but he, learned he how to do it. He was connecting with liberals. Not, not ordinary people. Hmm? Only politically, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> didn't mean that to sound the way it sounded. But You're saying only with partisans was he connecting. Let me define connecting, political connection. And this is a story about Frank Delano Roosevelt. And when he died, um, there was obviously a, a long cortege and his, his widow um, was on the bus or truck or whatever it was. And um, she saw a man collapse in Washington as they went by. So she felt very sorry and she went over to him. And she said, you're very upset. And uh, did you know my husband? And he gave this wonderful answer. He said, no, 
I didn't know your husband, but he knew me. Hmm. That's the kind of connection that Iggy could never make. Hmm. Uh, apropos of your story about the New Yorker and that wonderful or not so wonderful quote, Peter Newman's got a line in his book where he tells a story about David Peterson. David Peterson told him, Michael, I'm going to kick you in the nuts if you give a profound answer to how are you. The answer is fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's my premiere. <laughs> <laughs> but does that, does that kind of put your finger on part of the problem initially? Yeah, it, it, it really does. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, you think about an intellectual in politics who did well, right? Obviously, Prime Minister Trudeau comes to mind. And the secret, I think, um, and I'm schooled in this by great work that Peter wrote at the Star and, and, and you know, just, just the whole literature and folklore and having had the privilege of meeting the guy a couple of times and, and, and seeing him in action um, and growing up under his leadership. Uh, Trudeau was an intellectual who knew it and did not care what you thought about that. And you had to take him or leave him exactly as he was. And it was very clear that he would walk away as he did in 1979, even had he been rejected by the voters, he was perfectly capable of walking away and going out and living a nice life. And you knew that. You compare that with, with Michael, who seemed to be um, uncomfortable with being an intellectual, knew that it was probably going to be a losing hand for him. And I think that made him create a persona for himself on the fly very quickly that came across to most people as really insincere. Uh, I think he would have been a lot better off if he just said, you're damn right, I teach at Harvard, what's your point? Uh, would, have, would have come across a lot more sincerely in an age where authenticity in politics is actually probably prized even more than populist demeanor. You've got to be yourself. He had a terribly um, torturous problem with redemption. In our conversation, he always came and back to redemption. And in, in his novels, they were all about redemption. Mm. And what it was about, as far as I could tell, was his guilt in not, in, you know, he, he wrote about all these genocides and, and assassinations and murders, and he just was a witness, but he couldn't, it didn't do anything about it. And he felt guilty about that. And I once uh, tried to shock him into uh, recognizing, uh, or, or rather sort of help him through, through it, and I gave him a sweatshirt. I produced this in the middle of an interview. Susanna knew all about it, and she thought it was a great idea. Um, and the sweatshirt said, screw guilt. <laughs> and he didn't know what to do with it. He kept handling it like a live grenade. Um, <laughs> and he finally threw it in a drawer. But she said he, she would make him wear it. I don't know if he ever did. <laughs> uh, let me put a new issue on the table here, namely leadership conventions. Some of our best leaders have been battle-tested by vigorous leadership conventions. Pierre Trudeau winning on the fourth ballot, Brian Mulroney winning on the fourth ballot, Bill Davis winning on the fourth ballot, Dalton McGuinty winning on the fifth ballot. These guys went on to win a lot of elections. John Michael Ignatieff had the leadership of the Liberal Party handed to him. Was that a problem? Yes, it was. Um, he, he, I mean, <laughs> When I was working as Bob Ray's communications director trying to explain how we wanted leadership debates, um, we would try to convince some of Ignatieff's handlers that this would probably be good for Michael. Um, but obviously, considering the source, people discounted it pretty heavily and said, no, you're up to no good at all. So we never had any leadership debates. Um, it was probably a mistake. The only leadership debates that Michael did was in two, were in 2006. Um, the world was obviously a little different in 08, where he was so clearly the front runner. Um, I think, you know, I'm with James Carville on these issues. He says, you, you, in that accident, says, you got to air it out. You got to air it out. And if you don't have the practice, I, I don't think it's about conventions so much. Uh, the traditional, you know, broker delegated convention is probably a thing of the past. Um, I think probably people find those more distasteful now than they do dramatic and exciting. And they don't necessarily guarantee inspired results. You've rattled off a great list, but I could give you a list that includes, you know, people who've had a pretty tough time of it, like Stéphane Dion, who've come out of these things, or Joe Clark, who had a pretty tough time of it. It's not the convention, though. It's the campaign. And it's the discipline of going and actually having to connect with one room after another of people who don't know you and may not like you and want something from you. And you got to learn how to deal with them. 
uh, and you got to learn how to deal with opponents. I think, I think uh, Michael didn't have that chance. It wasn't fair. He wasn't well served by the people who shut down the leadership campaign around him. Peter, did he ever, you interviewed him several times for the book, did he ever indicate to you that in hindsight it was a mistake just to have the, leader, the leadership handed to him on a silver platter? No, um, he should have. I mean, I, I agree with uh, you know, what was said here because uh, you have to earn it, then it's valuable. It's like anything else. Um, but I, li I like to just briefly tell you a little parable. Um, and I was speaking to the um, Canadian Bar Association, a room full of lawyers, and uh, this is what I told them, and uh, uh, it's about a lawyer going to heaven. And about I, who going to heaven? Uh, well, <laughs> it doesn't happen a lot, but uh, once in a while, a lawyer goes to heaven. And he was very angry, uh, and he knocked on the pearly gates, and St. Peter came out and said, what's your problem? Uh, why are you so aggressive? People who come here are usually happy to be in heaven. And he said, well, there's been some terrible mistake. I'm 45 years old. I shouldn't be up here. I should be down there making money. And uh, St. Peter said, we don't make mistakes. <laughs> Where is it? Go, go look at your records. So he goes and looks at his records. He comes out, and he says, you're, you're 75 years old. What, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean? Well, St. Peter shrugs and says, we added up your timesheets. <laughs> how, how does that apply to Ignatius? Um, he was trying to get into heaven, you know, the fast way, and you can't do it. Um, and you have to pay that penalty, whether it's uh, in days or money. And, and uh, he, he never caught on to the, the dark side of politics. And by that, I mean uh, the, the rules that aren't written. The rules that are, uh, are there and are they're obeyed, but um, nobody talks about it. He, he, he didn't understand. It. He didn't understand the, the human side of politics. He, Let's talk about what has become. I just, I just want to jump in on that. There, yeah. there, there was, to to an extent, though, an accident waiting to happen there, in the sense that, uh, you know, Peter's describing this redemption shortcut uh, strategy. And at the same time, you know. The Liberal Party was looking for a quick fix, stairway to heaven. Mm -hmm. um, the Liberal Party got into the habit, uh, and, and this is what I call the Jim Travers Memorial Lecture, because Travers, may he rest in peace, wrote about this for years, and only after he passed away recently did the Liberal Party start to listen to him. He said, the Liberal Party has got to stop looking for a messiah every time it loses an election, and acting as though the only problem it has is it didn't have the right guy at the helm. And so that spirit was very much afoot in 2006 and very much afoot in 2008. And so you had a party looking for a shortcut to redemption and you had a candidate looking for a shortcut to redemption. Yeah. And guess what? Yeah. Uh, and accident, accidents happen when those sorts of things yeah. occur. The conventional wisdom around why Michael Ignatieff, one of the reasons why Michael Ignatieff's liberals lost this election was that his enemies defined him before he did. He, you remember the ads, right? He's just visiting. He didn't come back for you. Right. Peter, uh, in your view, uh, was that in fact the case? They yes. defined him before he did? Yes, and I'm just looking up the figure. There were something like 10,000 attack ads um, bought by the conservatives, and uh, the liberals who went from house to house found that those attack ads defined Ignatius. They would say, oh, he's, he's just visiting. Oh, he's, you know, he, he's here for himself. And uh, the liberal candidate would say, no, no, th that's what the attack had say. And the, the people would deny it. That's what they thought about him. It, it, it was a brainwashing exercise. John, why didn't the party respond quickly and adequately enough to those attack ads? Uh, three reasons. Uh, first of all, by all accounts, Signatiev himself didn't want to. He thought that they would collapse under their own weight. Nobody takes that stuff seriously, won't dignify it with an answer. Wrong. Um, second reason, uh, not enough money. Uh, you know, advertising is expensive. Uh, and it cost, I, I mean, you, we'll never know how much money went into that because money that gets spent 
in election advertising or in advertising outside of election frames isn't actually doesn't have to be reported under spending limits. So you just don't know how much got spent, but it would have been over ten million dollars easily, which is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, and 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 you can't fight back. And I think the third the third reason was because liberals have had trouble getting it through their head that the Ottawa Press Gallery is no longer the controller of the national conversation. Um, it was when I first started doing this kind of thing 30 years ago, and when people like Peter, you know, controlled the only places where the national conversation occurred, the Toronto Star, the, you, you know, the CBC and CTV to some extent, and, and Le Devoir and, and La Presse. Now we're in a world where those channels of communication count for so much less. Uh, and so just because half a dozen you know, columnists say, yeah, that's right, those attacks on Ignatiev are kind of ill-founded, well, big deal. Um, you know, if you, they can actually measure this. There's something called a GRP, a gross rating point. It's how many people get receive a message, and it's what the advertising industry runs on. And if you look at the count of the GRPs for Michael's actually a real guy, signed, you know, Chantal Hébert or, 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 you know, Barbara Yaffe, great journalist, versus the GRP count of those attack ads, it's just ridiculous. The, you, can, you can't compete. You can't compete that way. And the liberals have been slow to learn that change. But presumably, Peter, those attack ads can't work unless there's a nugget or a kernel of truth to them. Did the Canadian people, in their wisdom, decide that maybe this guy actually only did come back from Harvard because it was the one thing on his resume that he still didn't have? As unfair as that may be to say, but is that what they determined? Well, uh, yes, in that one instance. But most of the attack ads were, had very little connection with, with the truth. Um, what I reveal in my book is that, in fact, the liberals had the money. Uh, they had $23 million in their kitty when the election started. But um, they couldn't get at it because the, the, the structure of the party uh, used it up. You know, there were commissions and um, regional offices and all kinds of, it, it had solidified like an iceberg. Um, and uh, they had no money. Well, they, they published 200 uh, ads in a, you know, to attack Harper, which is nothing. Um, compared to the, the thousands, that the, uh, and, and, but they had the money and they couldn't get at it, and that's one of the reforms that absolutely has to. Come. I see John shaking his head. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I'd love to know where the hidden El Dorado of the liberal gold is. I know some people who, who could use it. I, I think I just don't. I just want to make sure that no one has the impression that the Liberal Party of Canada runs a twenty-three million dollar a year annual operating budget. It's nothing like that. It's a really, it's a really skinny operation. There are old pockets of money locked up in oddball trust accounts, some of which you don't really want to know where they came from because they're from the 60s when politics was a little different. The idea that you can just sort of sweat the system and, and, and get at that money is a bit far-fetched. But I will say this, Peter's absolutely right that, that the encumbered bureaucracy uh, and the entrenched bureaucracy the Liberal Party, which is quite an oddly bureaucratic operation uh, for something that's supposed to be a fighting machine, was something that I know the people around Michael found sort of to their surprise, wow, I mean, we're supposed to be in charge of it, but it seems to run itself. So there were problems there, not just with money. It's, it's one of the nasty surprises of Canadian politics when you understand the party kind of has a will of its own and does its own thing, at least at the administrative level. And Peter, when you watched him during the election campaign, I mean, he had his moments. My question is, did he deserve the result he got? 34 seats worth showing ever for the Liberals. Well, the quick answer is no, because he worked very hard. You know, it was a tough, tough, tough thing for him to do, um, just traveling and, uh, you know, not having uh, uh, any kind of comfort. Uh, on the other hand, um, he deserved it in the sense that uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't make a connection. And, uh, you know, he... he forgot that a party has to have a power base. He didn't try to evolve a power base. The power bases now are all gone. You know, the Quebec is gone, the Toronto is gone, Maritimes are gone, rural Ontario is gone. Those are the power bases. And he should have concentrated on that instead of spreading uh, his uh, presence too thin. So 
there was something wrong in the, in the strategy. And I, I don't blame the, the first group of advisors. Uh, I blame Donolo and the second group of advisors. Peter Donolo, the guy who they brought in later. Yeah. You thought, okay.